God is good. Wow, what a rain. And I drove in the sea and I said, where will the folks walk? Because, you know, just water out there. But I, I said, you know, before I left the house, I said, I am going to try to make it out. You know, so I rushed out and I, I just wanted to be here. And, and I told myself, God, your people are coming out tonight. And I know you would have died for one soul. And there could be just one marriage or one family that is about to be saved tonight. Amen. And so it's very, very important that we go through. And I'm just happy that you're here. I want to thank God for your pastor and his family and the opportunity to serve you. Amen. And uh, Marge just called while I says, I'm praying for you. I say, you go, girl. I need your prayers tonight. Amen. So we're going to go right into tonight's presentation. And um, at the end, as the spirit moves, you can ask your question. Okay? As the spirit moves, we'll open up for question and answer, as we have told you today. And I was planning that for tomorrow night. But like I said, I have been praying and wrestling with the spirit, and I like to submit and give in to the Holy Spirit. Amen? Tonight, Heavenly Father, we come to open up the Relationship Family Series. We thank you for the copious showers. We need the water. We thank you for those who have braved the weather and are here. There are yet others on their way. Hasten them on. But tonight, may we feel your spirit. Open our spiritual eyes of discernment to see that you are in control. Do for us now that which we are incapable of doing for ourselves. And again, speak through me to the hearts of your listening people. And as I speak forth, your words of truth and life may self be crucified. And may Jesus Christ and him only be lifted up and seen and let the church say, Amen. We want to build a foundation on the foundation. On the solid rock. What do you say? Who is the rock? Jesus. You got to talk to me tonight. Jesus is the rock. And his life was an example for us. And so we notice something here now. Jesus, the son of God, is about to enter his public ministry. Uh, we haven't heard much about Jesus prior to this time. The only noise or information that one could have heard concerning Jesus, you would have to be back there visiting John. Hey. Because John had never met Jesus. A lot of the people didn't even know Jesus or heard about Jesus. But John was always talking about one who would come. This one was so great because you see, you've got to understand that the people were talking about the greatness of John. They were elevating John. But John, through the Spirit, knew that one was coming who was greater than he was. So John started to shift the focus, the interest, the intent of the people from himself to Jesus. John, get this straight, John has never met Jesus. Of course, there were cousins. Never met. But what blew my mind is this. John was telling the people about the greatness of Jesus. So great is he, says John, that I whom you are exalting as being so great, I am not even worthy to stoop down and unloose the latchet of his shoe. 
And you know what hit me? Jesus, who knows everything, but up to that point, had not personally met John either. Jesus on the other side of Jordan, talking about the greatness of John. Never met. It's all about relationship. Jesus is saying here, of all the men born of a woman, none, none, none is as great as John. Never met. It blows my mind. John talking about his greatness, the greatness of Jesus, and Jesus talking about the greatness of John. Ah, what am I saying? There are some things that we have ruled out of our families. Empowerment and validation. We don't have a clue how important these things are to the growth and stability of family members. We don't know how to empower and we don't know how to validate. We think if we do this, we are blowing up people and puffing them up. I am saying it is important to validate, empower. And I'm telling you, ladies, as we go later on in the week, you're going to understand how this is important to men. My wife knows exactly what to do if she wants me to paint the house in one day. One day, just do what you need to do, girl, and you get the job done. Let's get back to Jesus. So here comes Jesus now, approaching John. And John looked up from the water, and that which he was talking about for weeks and weeks and months and months suddenly happened and he said behold you see because John had returned visitors <laughs> oh, there were people who were constantly just loved to hear John's preaching so they were going constantly not that they were baptizing every day but there were new people and so they understood immediately when he said behold the Lamb of God and they turned they turned and they saw Jesus and Jesus walked Straight to John. Can you see the crowd as they parted? Now, if John had not fixed it earlier on, they would not have shown that respect. So John, in his mind, led by the Holy Spirit, had to build the relationship for Jesus. Oh, you, didn't, you missed that. You missed that. John had to build a relationship for Jesus. So that when he appears, people show respect. Because by not showing the respect, you're also going to lose the blessing. So John built Jesus sufficiently enough so that when he said, here he comes. They didn't just turn their heads, but they made way. And he went straight to John. And something happened right there. He went to John. John was flabbergasted when Jesus said, John, it's good to see you, friend. I guess he said cousin. Good to see you. John says, it's good to see you too. I've been waiting for this for years. And then a little conversation ensued. You can imagine that. But then it got more serious when Jesus says, John, now I want you to baptize me. And John said, what? I want you to baptize me. You're joking, right? No, John, I want you to baptize me. I love you. I know who you are. Don't mess with my mind. I cannot baptize you. John, I need you to baptize me now. You can hear John coming up with excuses because John knew this is the Son of God. The spot, he himself said it, the spotless Lamb of God. You don't need to get baptized. You need to baptize me. 
And I could hear Jesus saying, shut up, John, and suffer it to be so now. And John looked in Jesus' eyes and recognized those words were the word of God. You don't argue with God. I'm taking you somewhere. Stay with me. So John baptized Jesus. And Jesus walked out of the water. And heaven was so pleased that God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Jesus went into the wilderness. And a lot of people said he went into the wilderness to be tempted. No, Jesus did not go in the wilderness to be tempted. He went in the wilderness to fast and pray where he was tempted. Yeah, let's get it right. After all of that now, I am now in the Gospel of John chapter 2. And the message begins. It's all about relationship and it's family affairs. Jesus started to select some close associates. We call them disciples. Jesus called them family. They were his family. His family. I'll prove that to you later on. And something was happening in a nearby town. Somebody was getting married. <laughs> and Jesus and his mother were invited. Well, something bad happened. A wedding is supposed to be a grand occasion. But at this wedding, something bad happened. When you study the historical account, you will understand that at a wedding, during the Hebrew economy, if you run out of food and especially wine, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace on the family. The couple would never overcome that disgrace. You're not supposed to run out of food, but especially wine. And on that day, they ran out of wine. Family crisis. And Jesus was there. Now Mary understood what was happening. Jesus is the answer to every situation and problem. He was the answer then and he is still the answer now. It's just that we are not willing to go to him. But Mary understood that. So watch Mary. Mary walked over to Jesus. And Mary said to Jesus, she didn't need to explain anything because the culture explained it already. If you don't have any wine and the wedding isn't finished, you're in trouble. So Mary said, there is no wine. Culturally, it means trouble. Trouble. And Jesus responded, come on, woman. My time is not yet. Watch Mary. She didn't argue. She says, son, there is no wine. Woman, my time is not yet. And she's gone. But watch this. Don't miss it. Before Mary left that presence where Jesus was and some other fellas, she pulled up close to the other fellas who supposedly were waiters, servants. 
And she pulled up close to them and she whispered, Hey, fellas, whatever he says to do, do it. And she's gone. And she's gone. That is the confidence of a mother who understood the crisis and recognized that there's one who controls and can resolve crises. She's gone. I want you to get this. When we preach most times, we talk about Jesus' miracle in turning water into wine. Very seldom, if ever, you heard about the obedience of the servants. Very seldom. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight, there would be no miracle had it not been for the obedience of the servants. That's why Mary had to fix that part too. Because the servants didn't know Jesus. Who are you to come and tell us to do this? So like John the Baptist fixing the relationship for Jesus, Mary had to fix the relationship for Jesus right there and then. So that when the command is given, fill the water pot, they would not frown. They would obey. It's all about relationship. But the real point I want to make tonight is simply this. If you miss everything else, don't miss this. Family is so important that the very first miracle that Jesus wrought was to fix a family. He started his ministry on fixing the family, mending a crisis. In the family, because the family is most important. And I told you earlier, and I'll get back to this later, to prove that their family, it was all about family. I noticed that he started his ministry fixing the family. Would you imagine, can you believe this, that he ended his ministry fixing the family? Just before he died, he turned to his beloved disciple, John, and said, John, John, in other words, my brother, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. In the last hour, Jesus was fixing the family. It's all about relationship I pray God that you don't miss it because you don't have a church if you don't have families family is the Im most important unit in the church and the devil is having a field day because we don't understand how important that is. And so we are taking family problems for granted. That because we are living on planet earth, we're supposed to have these problems. And so because we think this way, problems linger. We are living in a sinful world, so things must go wrong all the time. Get used to it. It's all about relationship. And it's about the family as we turn to the screen tonight. Beloved, I want you to understand, 
if we can fix this part of our lives, we would be able to tolerate anything. Anything. Oh, it's not turned on. Okay. I am not ashamed to say I'm technologically challenged. All right. All right. Do I get it now? And okay. All right. The sweetest place to be anywhere on planet Earth should be what? Uh, notice I'm using the subjunctive mood. Should be. Should be your home among family members. Am I right? Okay. Help me, Holy Ghost. Is my clicker not working? Help me here, Pastor. All right. You know, there's a saying that I know that you know. No matter where you are. Rome, there's what? No place like home. <laughs> All right. Okay. There are many people today in this world who are literally afraid of going home. Why? Husband afraid to go home because of the nagging, unloving wife. I'm saying to you, whenever you see a husband drives home and he sits on the garage parking lot or just before he enters the garage, five minutes pass. Ten minutes past, he is thinking, should I go in? Dangerous thing. Dangerous thing. And you should not be going into your own home, into your own house, and you're outside knocking. <laughs> Lord have mercy. You should have your own key. All right, let's move on. There are some wives afraid to go home because of an abusive and disrespectful husband. Work for a lot of people is an escape route. Can't wait to go to work and hate to come home and so they take all the overtime say they want more money. Just don't want to go home. <laughs> Let's move on. Some children are afraid to go home because home is like an insane asylum. Do you know that word? <laughs> home because they're noticing things happening in the home where they just don't want to go home. They are experiencing insecurity and fear. It's a place where they experience physical abuse, sexual abuse, and psychological abuse. Home for a lot of people are, is not safe. Not safe. Let me tell you something, folks. I'm told I'm going to scratch where it's itching. When my daughter turned 12, we stopped sleepover. You hear me? When she turned 12, no more sleepover. I don't care which Adventist home they're coming from. You understand that? You've got to wake up and learn, folks. Uh, a lot of things, uh, we, a lot of us have lost our children not in school, not in church, not in the community, but we lose them right there in home, in our homes, because of the people we bring into our homes. Marjorie and I agreed long time that no family member is coming to our house and they're going to sleep with our kids. You are out of your mind. Don't do it. And if you're doing it, stop it. Don't allow your daughter's cousin to sleep with your daughter. Don't allow your son's cousin to sleep with your son. Let him come and sleep in a sleeping bag by your bedside. I am serious as night follows day. Because you don't know the lifestyle of your brother's children. You don't know the lifestyle of your sister's children. So let's not go so far. Let's take it home. You don't know the lifestyle of your church brother's children. You don't know the lifestyle of your church sister's children. But no, you don't reason like that. You say, we are all Adventists. <laughs> well, I learned a long time that all Israel is Israel. 
And you have to understand that it is your responsibility to shield and protect your family. And she cried, Daddy, we are no sleep over. And soon and very soon, we have to watch Pathfinders going out. I'm just telling you like it is. If you can't have proper chaperone, watch it. I am saying we are losing our children in church. Because we are taking too many things for granted. Help us, Holy Ghost. Help me. Help me. It's all about our family. We don't understand. The devil is smarter than us. You can't outsmart him. You can't go toe to toe with him. All right? And the young people will get mad and frown. But it's tough love. They will understand in the sweet by and by. You owe it to them to protect them against themselves. You owe it to them. So what is home? If you ask some people what is home, it's a big question. They will tell you a place you go to sleep at nights. Home and family have lost its significance and meaning for many people. Am I speaking truth tonight? Yes. Home is a place you go and take a shower and change your clothes for the next job. Let's move on. God intended the home to be a place of what? Security. A safe haven of rest and relaxation. A place for communion with God and fellowship with family members. Home is a place where the husband builds and supports the wife. And the wife builds and supports her husband. A place where parents model for their children by setting the right example. That's home. That's home. The best training that a man could give to his son is to love and respect his wife, his son's mother. Best training. The best training that a woman could give to her daughter is to love and respect her husband, her daughter's father. But let me tell you where we are falling short. <laughs> Oh, I see my daughter excelling in school. I mean, that girl is so brilliant. Going to a four-year college and she's going to finish her degree in three years. She's just at the book. And I said, girl, you better learn to cook. Balance your life. I would prefer to see you being a strong B student than a strong A student and you're socially lopsided. And not properly domesticated. I am trying to say something to you tonight. We all fall a victim of this. We want our children to succeed academically. But let me tell you something. A test was run. A survey was done by the Seventh-day Adventist church. And they discovered that Seventh-day Adventist young people are among the brightest in the world. Among the brightest in the world. You know, we're talking about technology. Here we're talking about technology. About three years ago, Northern Caribbean University in little Jamaica, had some student who topped the world in technology. The brightest among the brightest in the world. But it's not over. The sad, the sad end to the story is that they, 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 they sum it up like this, that they, our young people are academic giants, but social dwarfs. Academic giants, but social dual. We don't know how to start relationship, maintain relationship, and conduct ourselves in relationship because we are not taught how to do that. I am talking about it's all about relationship. 
And we are seeing the results because more divorce in the church. Our membership is increasing, but so is the divorce rate. So what's the problem? You see, ladies and gentlemen, watch this. Our boys and our girls, they will spend years in college. How long do you take to train for a doctor? Seven years? Internship? How long do you take to train to be a husband? And the point I'm making out of that scenario is simple this. Watch this. You get a good education. You get a good solid job. Now you're ready to make money and enjoy life, but you get married. Lord have mercy. And you don't know how to treat your husband. And the husband don't know how to treat you. And with all the money, you're miserable. Not only are you miserable, but one divorce after another because you don't have the skill to maintain a relationship. Now, I'm, I, I'm just laying out straight, folks. Anything that is going to send your soul to hell should be discussed in church. Because we said the church is the gateway to heaven. Am I speaking truth? The church is the gateway to heaven. So if you don't know how to keep and maintain a relationship, we have to teach you that in church. Does it make sense? Makes a lot of sense to me. So I said, honey, You ain't going to cook nothing in no microwave. You're going to learn to cook. You're going to learn to cook. Told that to my sons. Hate the kitchen. I said, if you give the boy water to boil, he burn it. I said, you're going to learn. All I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, we are a part of the problem. We are perpetrating this problem because our concept of success is so wrong. Oh, we brag about our children. Oh, this one is that and this one is that. But when they are having hell in their marriage, you don't talk about it. Because you think that that's just because your son find a bad wife or your daughter found a bad husband. And you don't see you playing a part in all of that. Let's move on. If the children hear you quarreling and see you Bickering, let them see you hugging and kissing also in a loving way. Let them see father showing love to mother and mother reciprocated that love, giving it back. But a lot of us, we were socialized in such a way that we don't know how to show love openly. There are a lot of children don't see their parents in a loving atmosphere. You close the door. Well, let me tell you something. And we were raising our children. The first time we hug and embrace and kiss, yes, they giggled foolishly. <laughs> but when they finally understood that I could never leave the home without kissing my wife, because somebody's going to draw me up. Daddy, you forgot. It became a way of life. It was no longer a joke. It was serious business. But what was I doing? I wasn't just showing love for my wife. I was modeling for my sons and my daughter. It's all about relationship. So God has blessed us with three children. Two sons and one daughter. And let me tell you something, folks. 
my two sons, I would take them out on separate individual dates, religiously. They go out together, but there are times when we go out separately and alone because the two boys are like night and day. So I had to treat them differently and take them different places. And I was sharing that, I think it was today or sometime, about six months ago, my eldest son, 30 years, we were together, said to us around the table, Dad, you know what I miss the most? Those dates that we used to go out on. But we didn't just go and have party and fun. No, I'm teaching him how to be a man. I taught my son, I said, listen to me. I want you to have girlfriends. And I taught him what I meant by that. Now we're going to touch that subject when we come to the theology and the psychology of the touch. We're going to go in depth some more. I taught them how to generalize before they specialize. Because you're in a culture that is what by the devil that will mess up your mind. When our young people generalize, we thought they are flirting and they are wild and they are this. And not knowing that you are playing a part in helping to mess them up. So our responsibility is to teach them how to generalize before they specialize. And thank God they listened. They listened. And so people are surprised to hear that my sons are married young. I said, well, if you find a girl you love and you can make happy and you want to have sex, get married. So I guess all three played a part. Let's move on. They don't know how to treat their wives because of the lack of training at home. So love for most boys means sex. What a dilemma in the family when young boys can only interpret love as being sex. It's bad for the boys, but it's worse for the girls when that's how they interpret that too. Let's move on. Girls become women, then wives. But they don't know how to treat their husbands lovingly because of the lack of training at home. Love making is not sex. It may result or lead to sex, but it is not sex. And I tell folks, I make love to my wife every day. And they need to understand that. And you need to be able to talk about that. Let me tell you, I, I, I was living on the island of St. Lucia where I pastored a very large church, about 1,500 members, man, and, and I decided to do a family series. And I would announce the subjects each night. And when we announced, we were going to talk about love and sex. The church was full, but I noticed that there were no children. So I said, where are the children? <laughs> they said, Pastor, you're going to talk about sex tonight, so we plan something in the fellowship hall for them. I said, go and get your children. Go and get them. It is better when you teach your children in the sanctity and holy atmosphere, and you know that they're getting it right, than for them to get it warped. Because one of the worst things that could ever happen to you in your family, ladies and gentlemen, is for you to miscalculate the time. Oh, you missed that. You missed that. One day, my son, my second son, came home. He was only six. Only six. Crying because they were teasing him. I said, son, what's the problem? Daddy, I'm not going back to that school. I am not six. So what's the problem, son? They're teasing me that I have a girlfriend. I have a girlfriend. I said, what? 
they're teasing you. Come and sit beside me. And I put him to sit. I said, tell me what happened. Daddy, I'm not going back to that school. I said, son, you look me in the face. Never you come back in this house and tell me that you only have one. <laughs> he said, daddy. I said, son, you need to have plenty. It's a shame on you. You only have one girlfriend. Don't you ever come back in here, but you have one. I need you to come back and say you have plenty. Are you going to love them? Are you going to treat them? But you, you don't miss the intent. Even at six, even at six, there are some children who have already been messed up. Their minds already messed up. And you have got to be close enough to your children. Listen to them intently because they will tell you when they are ready to go to the next level. So that they don't have to hear anything from strangers. Listen to them. Talk with them. And they will drop little cues. Your daughter will tell you when she's ready to hear the delicate things of life. Just stick with them. Listen and for God's sake, build a relationship. We are not doing it right, saints. A lot of our brilliant children are not going to make it. Not because they are not getting good grades. But they are not prepared to enter the social arena. We are failing them. We can do better. We must do better. We owe it to them. There are a lot of single mothers struggling with boys that need help. There are a lot of single fathers struggling with girls that need help. What are we doing as an organization and as a church? What are we doing? This is my concern. Because this is where it's itching. We need answers. And there are answers. We need to tap into the resources. This church is not short of resources. It's not short. It's the most talented church in the world. But we are not using the talent in our churches. To do the work that God wants us to do. And so the sheep of the fold continue to suffer. And our families are now stretching like poor fabric. And some of them are so stretched that they are breaking. And we have the answer sitting in the pews. May God help us tonight as we get to the final section. God created this world. And the creation of man was based on relationship. God wanted to have relationship with man. He wanted man to enjoy themselves and the beauty of his creation. God is not selfish. Tonight, therefore, I'm going to stop here. Tonight, I want you to consider this. It's never too late to start doing the right thing. It's never too late to start doing the right thing. Don't say it's too late. Because you may not be able to help your son or your daughter. But you can help the grandchildren. You know, I've had seminars all over the world. And there are times when I announce certain topics. And this is what I hear from some retired people who are grandparents. Huh, that's not for us. 
And I am, it pains me. It tells me the level of the thinking. In other words, you are thinking only about yourself. So it's not for you. Don't you have a son? Don't you have a daughter? Don't you have grandchildren? And when they come around you, what do you have to give them? That's one of the problems in the church. We don't equip ourselves so that we have stuff that we can share with the young people. And so they don't come around us. We don't even understand their language. That must change. That must change. It's an indictment on us. Because we don't have to go outside for the resources. It's right here. Let us just learn to appreciate our own. Right here in this church. We have social workers, I'm sure, right here in this church. With information. With information. And that's why right now I'm putting together a directory. A type of portfolio. Send me the professionals in your church. Give me their names and addresses and a list. They may not be sent back to you to work, but I can send somebody to Orlando. You see, let's be real. A king doesn't have much honor in his own country. But the church has the resources. Give me those names. I'm working on the list now. We have got to start somewhere and begin to save the church. It's a paradox. We can't save anything, but we have to live to try. Jesus is Savior. Let's do it, folks. I need your help, and God needs your help. That's why he blessed you with the talent. That's why he has given you the ability. Now let us create the platform where you can utilize it for God. It's all about relationship. In closing, I want this church and I want you to begin to think more seriously about family. Do you know there are some of our churches that don't even have family life directors? That's how bad it is. But it's the devil. It's the devil's plan because there are some churches that believe that the family life director have to be a perfect couple. So if you have ever messed up in your life, you, you're disqualified. Where does Jesus come in all of this? Where do we talk about redemption? Forgiveness? And so therefore, the church continues to suffer. This is the greatest church on earth. And one of the things that make it so great, not just because Jesus is the head, but the Seventh-day Adventist church is made up of churches. It's the only church in the world that is made up of churches. In other words, we come from different churches. But one of the problems is There is a thing in social sciences, those who do counseling, especially for substance abuse, there's a word, it's called detox. You ever heard it? Detox. We don't have any system to detox people when they come into the church. So pastor, when they come in, especially come from another church, they come with their toolkits. I'm telling you, come with the toolkits. They know how to fix certain problems. I am saying, leave your toolkit at the door. Amen? Jesus is the chief physician. Anytime we need fixing, don't come to me. Come to Jesus. He can do it. All the problems we're having is because people don't know how to approach Jesus. 
it is alarming that we'd rather do the difficult thing than the easy thing. It is so easy to approach Jesus. But we'd rather circumvent. Why do we do that? Tell him your problems. No man is an island. No man stands alone. Everybody needs somebody sometime. So it's okay to find an earthly friend. I'm not going to say take your problem to Jesus and leave it there. Because I just told you that he is our example. And even Jesus had earthly friends. We don't know everything they talked about. But if you understand the life of Jesus, you'll get by. Not just get by, you will make it. Because they're going to gossip you just the same as they did Jesus. Are you going to make that a big thing because church member gossip you? They called him a wine bibber. They even said Mary was his girlfriend. So what? Tonight. You've got to think change. You cannot continue on the path that you're going socially and psychologically because you're hurting yourself and you're hurting those who are close to you. You can break the chain. My daddy was a drinker. And I told myself, I will not be a drinker. I broke the chain. So that I didn't have to pass on that to my children. My brother who was here today, he struggled to break the chain. He drank and drank and drank and drank and drank until Jesus found him. Couldn't break the curse. But I learned also that there are some curse you cannot break on your own. Jesus said, Brothers and sisters, prayer alone can work for this. It calls for prayer and fasting. Do you still fast here, church? A lot of churches don't know how to fast anymore. We have the power. We have access to the power. But we don't want to claim it. And so we just have a form, a form of godliness and denying the power. Tonight I declare to you that though he slay me, yet will I trust him. My family means a lot to me. The church family means a lot to me. Let us work together to cooperate with the Holy Spirit to help to save our families. When we come together to pray and fast, don't be afraid to tell what your son is doing. Don't be afraid to tell what your daughter is doing. You see, before power comes, you have to be humble. Before the power comes, you have to be humble.
While you may not pray things open in the public church, but we have prayer teams in the church. And as I close off tonight, let me share this with you. If you were to disclose something delicate that is hurting you to a brother or a sister, and you hear it in the church, I challenge you. You don't even have to pray for that person because that person is already cursed. Do you hear me? Curse be that person. Because that action is Beelzebub. Because we are our brother's keeper. So because I need somebody to confide in and to talk with and I need some support and I tell you something that I did that was so wrong and it's killing me and it's hurting me and I, I pray to God but it's on my chest and I come and I share it with you and you encourage me and pray for me but because you have another friend, you tell them to. Curse be you. And you're going to have to pray for your sins. So tonight, let us understand, we are our brother's keeper. And we need to understand as a church, that is not everything we disclose. Because love can cover a multitude of sin. Amen? If the sinner is repentant, let us save the brother. Let us save the sister. Don't be a church where the man committed some sin 10 years ago and now that he's about to get a church office, you are reminding him. Don't do that. Jesus would not do that. Life is about relationship. Jesus is about relationship. Our salvation is about relationship. So when God the Father is about to blot you out because of relationship, Jesus steps forward and says, no Father I died for that one too. May God help us tonight to recognize and may you leave here saying these words as Job said thousands of years ago though he slay me yet will I trust him. God bless you. Let us bow our hands as we pray.